I'm Tom Polasic, and I'm a professor of surgery, director of focal therapy, and urologic oncology fellowship at the Duke University Medical Center. I thank the hosts for the opportunity to speak at the IPCU convention. And I was asked to speak on the topic of focal cryosurgery, the outcomes, and some of my observations over the last several years. I thought a good way to do this was to present a case. This is a typical man that I would see in my practice. He's 64 years old, he's healthy. He has over a 10 year life expectancy. His PSA level is 6.7. He has clinically significant prostate cancer, PGG2 with 30% Gleason grade four component, a 1.2 centimeter lesion on MRI, no extra prosthetic extension. He has a SHIM score of 19. He does take a small dose of Viagra to uh, give him a boost and he has good urinary uh, function. He tells me that he has a younger spouse. He's recently been remarried and he wants to know his treatment options and potential outcomes. So what he's conveying is that he has very high stakes expectations for a good functional outcome. This is very important to him. He also told me that he's met with a radiation oncologist and of course his local urologist uh, counseled him as well. He tells me that uh, his local urologist was trying to rush him into the operating room to take out his gland, but he was doing some reading and he's very concerned about some of the side effects of radical prostatectomy. So many of the patients that come in for focal targeted therapy feel this way. And I feel that focal image guided treatment and particularly cryosurgery can obviate the concerns associated with radical treatment, particularly the functional outcomes of urinary control and sexual function. Now, what does the patient look like who comes to the office? Now, this is a very different type of patient than we saw 20, 30 years ago. Patients nowadays are educated. They're sophisticated. They're on the internet. They're connected. They're very rational. They're looking for the magic bullet, something that'll control the cancer and preserve their function. And before you, know, you feel like you're the physician and, and what you say is gonna be heard and followed, I wanted to bring up this paper. This was published several years ago, and it's a survey on almost 500 young men, less than 50. So it's a little bit different than this gentleman who's in his 60s, but I think it illustrates the point. Um, and this is regarding uh, counseling. You could see in the first bar surgery, uh, radiation or active surveillance. And the finding was, was very interesting that in the younger men or the more sophisticated one that the doctor's recommendation was less influenced um, particularly in terms of active surveillance, or you can also elude uh, image guarded ablation. So the goals of image targeted focal cryoablation are to eradicate the image uh, abole lesion. This has to be biopsy proven. You wanna avoid urinary and sexual dysfunction associated with radical treatment. And the patient wants a fast, simple outpatient procedure. He doesn't want any downtime. So focal therapy can take on a number of meanings. Um, it's customizable. So here are, are four schematics. In the top left is what the ideal is. If you see a lesion on MRI, you wanna put your probe or device, whatever you're using, HIFU, et cetera, and treat the tumor, which is uh, in, in red, plus a margin around it, a safety margin, which some say could be up to a centimeter because actually what you see on MRI isn't what you see on pathology. Below that is the classic treatment, the hemiablation. We've been doing this uh, since around the turn of the century. Gary Onik was one of the first pioneers who described this. It was based on the finding of unilateral cancer 
And in this case, you would sacrifice one nerve and ablate the other. Quadrant ablation is what we've uh, gone to in cryotherapy for the most part. It's hard to do real targeted image ablation because cryotherapy is more of a broad brushstroke. So quadrant ablation is, is the common one. It has a very broad margin, uh, which is good for cancer control. And then the bottom right, you see the hockey stick pioneered by Steve Jones and, and, um, and others. Uh, whereby uh, the uh, field of ablation would extend to the contralateral anterior zone. And this is based on uh, Jonathan Epstein's work at Hopkins, which did find a fair amount of clinically significant cancer in the anterior uh, zone on the contralateral side. So for our patient, you can see the lesion uh, on the left side of the screen, or that's his right side of the prostate in the coronal view. You could see the white, which is the uh, cryopro being placed into the lesion. Uh, this is a um, 1.2 cc lesion, GGG2 prostate cancer. And then the question is, how do you target this? Well, traditionally we've used um, three probes and I'll, I'll tell you why in a few minutes but you wanna overlap the ice and make sure that you get a very cold kill zone. So that would be the traditional way of doing it. Of course, with a smaller lesion, and if you try to do this in the clinic setting, it is possible to put in a, a single probe or perhaps two probes, but triangulation was, was the way to, to achieve very cold ice temperatures. These probes are typically placed within two centimeters of one another. And then the question is, well, Many of these ice products can treat the whole length of the prostate. So what do you do about that? I think many cryotherapists do treat a broader length just because of the technology, but you can in fact shorten the length of treatment as seen on the left side, which is the sagittal view, uh, to really get your ice, your lethal ice right on the lesion. So this is a direct minimally invasive approach via the perineum, it's outpatient. The OR time with the double freeze thaw cycle is 45 minutes or less. It's customizable, controllable, it's guided by uh, imaging and you can monitor uh, the treatment in real time. Um, we keep a Foley in for several days because you can still get uh, swelling and we try to avoid retention, but you can make the argument for this particular patient illustrated with a small lesion, maybe um, even try without a Foley or a short-term Foley. And this is all done to preserve erectile and urinary function. So here's a schematic with a red uh, circle around the lesion. And it's very easy to throw your Doppler ultrasound on the neurovascular bundles, as you can see here and monitor the flow to, uh, to that nerve bundle uh, in real time. And we do this uh, with uh, focal cryoblation. We do it less so with whole gland, but with focal, we're more concerned about the outcomes. We'll use the Doppler and we'll put a probe, a temperature mounting probe around that bundle. So cryotherapy is probably one of the easiest uh, modalities to monitor in real time because you can actually uh, see the ice ball. You can see that on the left, you see the um, uh, temperature thermocouples. You can place these where you want. Typically you put it around the sphincter, the rectal wall, and as mentioned, I put it around the, the nerve. Now, so I'm gonna spend a few minutes on how this works. First, you have extracellular ice crystal formation, and then there's changes with the solutes uh, moving out of the cells you get cell shrinkage, and then you get intracellular ice last. So there's a number of me uh, mechanisms of action that make cryoablation lethal. Now, lethal ice, I would say, is about minus 40 centigrade. Uh, here it's minus 80. For sure it's dead, you get necrosis. You have other mechanisms too. You have metabolic uncoupling due to hypothermia. Uh, actually, the energy leaves the cell. So it's an energy deprivation type of a treatment. You get free radical, waste accumulation, ionic balance shifts, pH changes, 
uh, the membrane begins to disintegrate, the cytoskeleton dissembles, and uh, et cetera. At the end, you get vascular stasis and activation of the local immune system. And in the end, you get uh, on the right uh, coagulative necrosis. Now, what else can we do to improve cell kill? I just want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the basic science work. We've looked at vitamin D3 as a cryosensitizer, started in a murine prostate cancer model. We developed this model, um, and then we um, have uh, used this in the patient population. This is all done through a, a mitochondrial-mediated apoptotic mechanism. And as you can see here, uh, this is the effect of vitamin D3 at freezing at minus 15, which is just about enough uh, cold temperature to, to begin killing cells. On the left, you have Ellen cap. This is androgen sensitive. You can see compared to controls here on the left, minus 15, you get some repopulation of cells over time, but when you add vitamin D here, it's pre um, prevented. And you can see here with a more aggressive androgen insensitive, you get more repopulation because you need colder temperatures. So what does this look like? Um, you can see in the top right, now this is the, the antigen sensitive single freeze. You get some repopulation of cells after a single freeze in the green. When you add vitamin D, you see less repopulation. When you use an antigen insensitive cell in the middle, um, you know, a single freeze is not enough to kill it, but when you add vitamin D, uh, it does a better job. And then when you do the double freeze thought in the androgen sensitive, again, on the bottom graph, uh, the, um, the um, vitamin D does help. So let's look at some of the outcomes. We'll look at IPSS, uh, flow, bother, and erectile function. The functional outcomes are actually excellent. Continence is strictly defined as no pad use. It approaches 100% for image guided ablation. Potency uh, varies depending on, you know, where the uh, lesion is and the location of the bundles. Uh, this is our data looking at uh, 71 men who underwent customized treatment. And as you can see here, the freedom of uh, failure, freedom survival at five years is about 75%. Of course, you can repeat this if you need it. And these are the functional outcomes. So this is the uh, mean IIEF score. You know, most men who come to us, they, they don't, they're not completely potent. They start, you know, probably in the, the higher teen level. You get a drop in function over time. And by six, 12 months, they're back to their baseline. And you can see the differences between focal hemiablation and, of course, subtotal, where you're freezing more, has a worse functional outcome. This is the, uh, the data on um, urinary uh, flow the IPSS score. Again, most men start with reasonable or low score, and it does improve over time as well. This is some of the data of most recent, uh, SHA 2019, uh, OSHI 2019 for focal cryoblation. And as you can see here on the right, in terms of metastasis-free survival, cancer-specific survival, urinary continence, and uh, potency, all this is very, very robust, especially the short-term cancer control and the metastasis-free cancer-specific survival. Just wanted to make a mention of the anterior ablation. Again, we're seeing more anterior tumors based on the use of MPRMI and biopsy. This is a study of 17 patients who underwent anterior ablation. And as you can see here, no infield recurrence of Gleason grade two or higher, Functional outcome at 12 months, we don't change the IPSS at all. And the IIEF essentially is unchanged because we're away from the nerves. This is how the setup looks. You can see the probes are placed. They're anterior here on the right. You can see the freeze. It doesn't really go below the uh, urethra. And uh, the outcomes are quite robust. So I think the future of focal cryoablation is uh, very bright indeed. It's an office-based approach. We have portable devices for treatment and monitoring. I think it's gonna go robotic. What does the patient want? They want an office-based approach. They want it to be pain-free, a rapid recovery. They wanna maintain their quality of life. And we're working on durable cancer control, but you can repeat this without burning any bridges. That's been demonstrated. 
It doesn't preclude any other therapies and cryo is relatively inexpensive. Finally, you have to talk to the patient to make sure their expectations are realistic and that they will come in for follow-up. Um, this is my summary slide as was discussed. This is personalized therapy. And I'd like to um, invite everyone if they like this concept, we have the Focal Therapy Society where we discuss these kind of issues. Thank you for your attention.